All right, we are live. It is 4 p.m. Eastern time, and uh, we're going to give it a few minutes to let folks uh, join in the stream as I post the link to the stream across social media. So hello and welcome, everybody. We'll get started in about five minutes. I should be able to pull up. That's loud. <laughs> there we go. All right, and then when I want Ryan back, I should be able to do that. <clears throat> well, how come he's not on there? That's weird. Hmm. It worked last week. <laughs> uh oh. Can you hear me still? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got you, but I can't get you back on the screen. <clears throat> Is it AirPlay or? Yeah, man. I'm using AirPlay and. What the heck? There you are. All right. We'll make it work. <clears throat> we'll figure it out. It's very informal. All right, let me grab the link so I can post to folks. Share. How's the weather in Mississippi? It's getting pretty warm already. It's 85 right now. It's about that here. Yeah. <clears throat> Today we talk hurricane tracking and reconnaissance. Much easier to just say that than spell it out. <laughs> All right. A couple more spots and then we'll start up. <clears throat> Today we talk about hurricane tracking and aerial reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. Hey everybody, we'll get started here in a couple of minutes. This is just the, the warm up as I post the live link across my social media platforms. Feel free to share it, by the way. Sounds like a cat. <laughs> Is that a cat? You got a cat there? Do I? No. Oh, thought I heard a cat. It's probably my kids. <laughs> so yeah, I sent all I sent all mine out. <laughs> we have uh, six kids at home right now. Oh my gosh! And so we I sent them all out with my wife to go on some nature trails. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, but the people that are behind me. The houses here are pretty close to each other. They're having a pool party, so we might hear their kids. So I got rid of my kids. Now we'll hear the neighbor's kids. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, we'll get started here in just a moment. We'll do a formal opening and all that good stuff. 
Lieutenant Colonel, right? That's correct. All right, you can hear me okay, because I just want to make sure. Yep. All right. <clears throat> You're coming through nice as well. Come on. A little extra volume. All right, let's get started here, shall we? All right, good afternoon, everybody. Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com here. Welcome to another live broadcast of Hurricane U, the educational series where we discuss hurricanes, different aspects of hurricanes. More specifically, or I guess hurricanes is the, the specific term. More generally speaking, tropical cyclones, of which hurricanes are part of that phenomenon. Uh, and the idea is to kind of give you sort of a master class one-on-one -on -one time with experts. You know, you've seen me on my videos, my documentaries for, you know, well over uh, 20 years. And I know a lot about hurricanes, but I don't know everything, and neither do you guys. So I figured, uh, what a better way to <clears throat> spend all of this time that we have in our houses uh, than to learn more about hurricanes. This was actually supposed to be an audio podcast that I was going to start <clears throat> producing in the month of April and then start rolling it out over the next several weeks uh, because I was going to be traveling to some hurricane conferences and I was going to be meeting up with different people and I was going to interview them and start putting these podcasts together like The Daily from The New York Times, if you're, if you're familiar with that, with Michael Barbaro. I wanted to do something like that, but about hurricanes. And all of the conferences, of course, were canceled and we are all now part of what I call the Great <clears throat> Time Out. Welcome to the great timeout, the global timeout, and here we are. So it's going to be a live broadcast where anything can happen, hopefully it won't happen. I got all my kids out of the house with my wife. They're out enjoying some nature trails. Um, but behind me, the neighbors are having a pool party with their kids, so you never know. Maybe a child will come <laughs> launching through the window as they get off the diving board or something. But anyhow, uh, it's great to have you tuning in, and again... The idea here is to educate you, get you familiar with, you know, what we're talking about when we talk about different aspects of hurricanes. And today we're going to focus on hurricane tracking and aerial reconnaissance. You know, we're not going to talk about seasonal forecast. This is not that type of discussion. This is more focused on a couple of specific areas as it relates to hurricanes. So let me get the iPad functioning the way I need it to so that I can get our special guest on screen without any issues, hopefully. Look at that, it worked. <clears throat> All right, so we'll bring our guest in in just a moment. First thing I wanna talk about, just real quick, is hurricane tracking. This is a paper hurricane tracking chart. Remember these? These uh, are what I grew up with. And um, this is one that I have produced. Uh, which I talked about in my Hurricane Outlook and Discussion video for this week. But that's what a hurricane tracking map <clears throat> looks like. Hurricane tracking map. So very basic, you know, to, to teach you a little geography here, we track hurricanes once the in information comes out, depressions, storms, and hurricanes, and even low-level invest now, using latitude and longitude. And we do it using these maps. Now, most of the maps we see these days are on apps or online. Some of them are very sophisticated and they drill down to street level. But I like these old school paper tracking maps. Uh, this is how I started my career, was producing these many, many years ago. And it's all about the basics here. You know, we're, a lot of people are doing homeschooling and uh, things like that. So here's your homeschool lesson. Latitude and longitude, that's how we plot these. And so when the National Hurricane Center says that Hurricane so-and-so is located <coughs> at what we're gonna do, we're gonna, we're gonna mute you just for a minute, Mr. Rickert, while you deal with Sorry. your allergies. It's all right, it's all right. I got it up so loud. Where's the mute button? Right there. All right, um, latitude, longitude is how, I told you anything could happen. Uh, it's allergy season, especially in the South, and uh, he's down in Mississippi. We'll bring him in in a moment. But look, it's all very basic here. We get lat-long coordinates from the National Hurricane Center. We get those about every six hours. We plot that on tracking maps, and we see what's going on. And I think that's so important that we understand the basics here. We get so lost 
in the noise of, well, how strong is the hurricane going to be? Where is it going to go? What are the impacts going to be? And I think we've lost the art of just understanding basic hurricane tracking. So as we get started here and I introduce my guest, we're going to start at the beginning. How do we get the information for tracking tropical cyclones and, you know, especially hurricanes? Where does that come from? And uh, we will talk to our guest as I unmute him now. And <clears throat> my throat starts to get tickled with <laughs> pollen. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to start at the beginning and we will go from there. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce our expert today, our special guest. I met this man at the National Tropical Weather Conference down in South Padre Island, which was supposed to have happened last week, but this stupid virus canceled that. <laughs> and so here we are. But um, this is uh, Lieutenant Colonel... Man, what an honor to be able to say that, right? I think it's the first time mm -hmm. I've ever introduced anybody by a lieutenant colonel or anything. This is Lieutenant Colonel Ryan Rickert of the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron out of Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Mr. Rickert, Ryan, if I may call you that, Lieutenant Colonel, thanks for joining me. How no, are Ryan's you? Ryan's fine. <laughs> How are you today, sir? Good. Glad to be here, Mark. Thanks well, I, for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so... First, let's start with who you are and what you do. Take it away. Okay, so my name is Ryan Rickert, and I am in the Hurricane Hunter Squadron. Um, I joined about five years ago, uh, 2015. And before that, just a little bit of background about myself. I graduated with a meteorology degree from Penn State, joined active duty Air Force, uh, stuck it out in active duty side for about 12 to 13 years and then trans transition over to the reserves. So I uh, did a lot of traditional weather support for the Air Force and the Army prior to this job. And it's kind of where I learned a little bit of my foundation and, uh, you know, a little bit about forecasting, supporting other customers and uh, users with uh, weather support. Uh, so about five years ago, I joined the Hurricane Hunters. Uh, it takes about a year and a half to get trained to do what we do. So about uh, for the last three and a half years, I've been doing that uh, on my own. Very good. <clears throat> so your job is to literally track hurricanes out over the water. Was that a, a pretty good way to put that? I mean, that's part of your job. You track them yes. over the water. There's not really aerial reconnaissance over land, right? That's correct. All right. So what happens... First, we see an area of interest. You guys get tasked, guys and gals. Uh, so what happens? Walk me through that process. We're all watching it on social media. We're tracking it on tropical tidbits. It's all over social media that there's an invest so-and-so. We're going to talk about what that is in a minute. What is an invest? But once that happens and you guys get tasked, what happens then? So, yeah, a lot of this happens behind the scenes prior to the information that you start seeing on TV. Mm -hmm. um, we have a section in our squadron that is basically they're called current operations. So every morning, the National Hurricane Center, uh, the forecasters are looking at uh, areas throughout hurricane season, um, throughout the night. And then we have a, a section there called CARCA. They're basically the liaison from the National Hurricane Center, and they fall under our unit, and they contact us every morning after they get the requirements from the forecasters. So the forecasters will meet in the morning with our liaisons that are there, and they'll basically tell them, hey, we want this area investigated, this area, we need a certain amount of flights into this. And they'll define the requirements, and then our guys that are there at the Hurricane Center, they actually work. Uh, an office away from them will call us on the phone and coordinate that through our section uh, at the 53rd. Mm -hmm. um, so they're actually, that section is not fall under the 53rd. It's overarching, but uh, we relay that information to the 53rd we're right. going to constant squadron. So they will um, give us the details, the specifics, of the areas that they want us to investigate. Uh, it could be what you said and invest, you know, an area that has not developed or formed yet. 
all the way up to a, a Category 5 hurricane. Right. And um, <laughs> they will give us the details, uh, where it's located, latitude and longitude. You spoke of that already. The, the movement of it. So by the time we actually fly into it, we'll know where it needs to be. So that's how we'll basically plan our mission the day prior. Um, we'll give them, we'll actually give them a call back and give them the specifics. And then that's when they issue the plan of the day. It's called the pod. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. <coughs> it's not coronavirus, I promise. <laughs> um, so that's when they'll actually issue the plan of the day on the National Hurricane Center's site. Right. Uh, that a lot of people are aware of where that's located. Yeah. And you'll see all the different aircraft reconnaissance requirements uh, for that day or the following day or two located there. And that includes us, the mm -hmm. 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, uh, the NOAA Air Operations Center, and anything else that's going on uh, related to aircraft reconnaissance. But our unit and NOAA AOC is the, the primary ones that you'll see on there. Are you all the only ones that do the <coughs> low-level invest? Or, so NOAA won't do a low-level invest to start <coughs> off. Is it always the 53rd? It's typically us, um, unless uh, there's yeah. a lot of high demands or high requirements. Um, I think we actually had them, they had to do one last year for us because we had um, multiple assets. I believe it was for Dorian. I think we were flying multiple missions sure. for Dorian, and then there were some other issues with aircraft. Um, so I believe NOAA AFC picked up an invest for us last year. However, Typically, we'll do the invest um, investigative areas. So let's start with that. We hear about that a lot. People will say, and in the last several years, more people are latching on to these invest areas, and you'll hear them talk about 90L, 99L. What exactly does that mean? Now, obviously, I know the answers to these, but I'm pretending like our audience doesn't. So what is an invest, and what does it mean if someone says, hey, what's going on with 92L? Yeah, so uh, obviously the Hurricane Center or, or whatever uh, area of responsibility center names those, um, and then that's actually part of the requirements. So if, if the Hurricane Center or Central Pacific Hurricane Center or CPHC out in Hawaii, if there's an area that they need us to investigate, uh, you know, prior to it becoming a, a closed circulation, they'll have aircraft reconnaissance go out there and uh, it basically means that they are unable to close it off using right. uh, the you know satellite imagery or, or microwave imagery or anything that all the other tools that they they use to determine a tropical cyclone. Right, it's a suspect so area. Need, yeah, it's basically an area that they think potentially could develop into a tropical cyclone, um, but they want to get an aircraft out there to basically either find a closed circulation or the lack of circulation. Right. So uh, we will do different uh, patterns to fly in that area uh, to see if we can either find, basically it's called the four winds, the four quadrants of winds. Right. Um, that define a, a closed circulation or um, the lack of it. It'll sure. it potentially or or sometimes it could be an open wave or multiple circulations, um, you know, finding the dominant circulation over other, you know, little circulations. So um, theirs are actually the most challenging mission sometimes uh, because yeah. you really have to use your meteorology. You have to understand a little bit about, you know, uh, circulations and uh, what, you know, troughs and things like that as you're flying and you're starting to map the winds on our graphics, um, sometimes our, our map graphics on our, our computer. So, um, and then sometimes the hurricane center will start telling us where they want us to go. If they, if we've flown to the area that they want us where they think there might yeah. be a circulation or uh, the lowest pressure, we get out there and there isn't anything. They'll start telling us, well, uh, last couple frames of satellite imagery, we'd like you to go check this area out. So, sure. They'll start um, telling us to go to areas of interest outside of the per initial area of interest that they sent us to sometimes. So, very basic question, but how do you do that communication? Is it through satellite phones? Is it some <clears throat> kind of 
radio. I mean, how do you all talk to each other? And you're flying, and we'll talk about this in a moment, you're not flying a brand new jet or a brand, <laughs> these are some old airplanes. I've been in one of them. Haven't flown in it, but I tour right. right. So how do you all communicate? And then we'll talk about the hardware itself, the the, the ride yeah. that you have. Uh, so our our main communications is uh, through satellite communications, satcom. And okay. It's, uh, uh, basically, we log into uh, satellite communications via a couple. Uh, I guess basically it's a, a channel that we we've been dedicated to log into and they log into it as well. And then we basically, it's uh, kind of like emails, short emails and ch chatting basically. Gotcha. So okay. we'll, we'll send a text message. Um, we'll send it, they'll receive it on their end. So wow. they're kind of like short email messages. I gotcha. So it's not a big phone like you see in the movies <laughs> and you know, <laughs> we actually do have a satellite phone as a backup means to communicate with them when our satellite communications um, goes down. So gotcha. it has come in a very um, good use uh, when our satellite communications go down. We, so we have no way to contact them. Right. Um, but now we do have a satellite phone on our, all our aircraft, and it's, it's a good way to kind of troubleshoot, right. see what's going on, um, and be able to get back up on our satellite communications. Well, I think this will shock people. So let's talk about your ride. What kind of a plane is it? What kind of planes are they? How old are they? And just walk me through that. Let's start with how old are these planes? So uh, we fly in WC-130J models. So they are the newest variant of a C-130. However, the Hurricane Hunters got the first uh, order of C-130Js in the Air Force fleet. So ours range from 1995 through, I believe, 1999 or 2000. So 25, 20 to 25 years old aircraft. Right. So people that are driving around in an eight-year-old car or a 12-year-old SUV or my Chevy Tahoe that we just retired a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was an 01 Tahoe. You know, these... And it's been in a lot of hurricanes itself, but you know these are not brand new, um, and they're not old clunkers either. But these have these have been put through the ringer, and you guys literally fly these. You know, you do the eye wall penetrations, and we'll get to that. But I'm just trying to paint right. the picture here that um, it's it's not modern technology per se, as in oh this was last year we got a new plane and it's kind of getting there almost a generation old but they're obviously extremely reliable well fairly <laughs> true true so they get it done they're getting older so as you can imagine the older uh machine or you know something gets it requires more maintenance more upkeep ah, right. so um you know, 10 years ago, they weren't having nearly the problems that they might be having now. And then it requires a lot more downtime to get those fixed. Uh -huh. So there's also what they call a depot level maintenance where um, the aircraft actually, ha after it gets to a certain age or away from maintenance, like actually tearing pieces of the airplane apart, it has to go back to the depot and actually get a lot of things, mm. you know, they tear a lot of things apart. They go into it, they fix things and do whatever, and then make sure that the structure is okay too. So um, they've been doing that a lot more often as well over the past five years. So um, yes, yes and no, they're a very reliable aircraft, you know, None of us really are in fear of our safety because of the age of them or, or whatever. They're very durable aircraft. However, um, the reliability of them has diminished over the last 10 years just because they are becoming older, just with anything. And can you speak to, are there any plans <clears throat> to bring any newer generations of planes out, if you can talk about that? If you can't, I understand. Uh, not that I know of. Okay. I mean... Simple I'm answer, not right? That high level <laughs> to understand, you know, what's going on. I'm pretty sure the goal is to 
continue to sustain these as long as they possibly can. I right. believe the H model, the previous variant that we flew on hurricanes, uh, that one flew a lot longer. So I want to say they're still flying H models. They are definitely are transitioning them out. Right. Um, but I want to say that they were around 30 to 50 years. Yeah, I mean, I'm thought. not sure exactly, but um, they've been around a long time as well. All right, so um, just some simple <clears throat> questions. So how fast do you guys typically fly through a hurricane? You know, what's your typical airspeed? And do you find, do you have to, do you have to adjust that from time to time? You know, give people an idea of commercial aircraft versus how fast are you flying? Yeah, we fly pretty slow compared to a commercial aircraft. Uh, in a storm environment, we fly roughly 180 knots indicated. Um, that's really the, the premier, uh, air speed, um, so for stalling and, you know, rough, rough penetration of turbulence and things like that. So for our aircraft, it's, it's roughly 180 knots. Um, now ground speed, it's, you know, it varies on, of course, you know, when we're on the cross legs of a, a hurricane, we can, um, we can speed it up. But when we go through weather and things like that, we, we typically keep it around that 180 knots. And then how high up? What's your and altitude? Then, Sorry, didn't mean to step on you there. I was just going to say, you know, compared to a commercial aircraft, um, I believe, you know, 400 and 500, you know, 400, 500 miles per hour, they might be flying right. a much higher altitude, a lot more efficient, yeah. you know, 40,000 feet. Sure. Whereas our aircraft, um, when we're flying in the storm environment, we fly 10,000 feet and below. Gotcha. To, uh, for the invest, we can fly during the daytime because of uh, safety. We can fly down to about 500 feet above the water. Man, you can get a drone pretty low. that high. <laughs> I mean, right Wouldn't do it, water. but yeah, yeah, 500 feet. That's, I mean, wow. Yeah, it's, it's low. I mean, you're... You're seeing a lot of ocean at that point. But I, I didn't mention earlier, um, the reason we fly that low for the invest, so just think of it, the stronger the hurricane or the stronger the, the storm is, so you start out low, 500 feet for an invest. The stronger it gets, the higher you get because of safety yeah. and the strength of the storm. So you're able to get a lot of the data uh, from a, a stronger storm, you don't have to be that low. Okay. So, you know, a tropical storm, 50 knots, you don't have to be 500 feet above the water to get, you know, good data. You know, if we're at 5,000 feet, we now can drop drop signs. Okay. So we're getting vertical profiles of the atmosphere. We have the step frequency microwave radiometer, which is a passive microwave sensor that can also determine what the wind speeds are based on the ocean roughness of the of the ocean because of the winds. Yep. So we have that instrument now that does really well at 5,000 feet and 10,000 feet. Um, and then a lot of times you still can see the surface of the ocean. So sure. our eyes are trained to tell what the wind speeds are based on what the ocean looks like as well. So How about that? You still get to see that a lot um, at 5,000 feet. So the reason that we're at 500 feet for an invest is Typically, we're using our eyes to tell what the winds winds are yeah. and the direction of the winds. So if we can get all four winds in those quadrants, yeah. then basically we've closed that circulation off uh, with reasonable um, accuracy of the strength of the wind and then the vector of the wind. Um, we can tell the Hurricane Center, hey, we found in yeah. each quadrant and we, we know there's a low pressure and we know what the wind speeds are. Uh, based on our eyes, and we've verified it also with our SFMR as well, too. So, and right. now you're at 500 feet, too, so the yeah. flight level winds are very close to what the surface winds are going to be, too. That's right. So that makes sense. So now you have the flight level winds of the aircraft at 500 to 1,000 feet. Right. So that they're almost, you know, identical at that, you know, week of a system. So. so when you measure the wind in a tropical cyclone, and for the sake of this question, let's just... Uh, assume for a moment that it's a Category 3 hurricane that we're talking about. 125 miles per hour uh, reported at the last advisory. You all fly out there, and you're getting these wind measurements. Now, 
When I measure hurricanes on land, we are using an anemometer. It is a propeller-based, actually technically it's called an impeller, but it's a propeller-based arm young piece of hardware, one of the best in the world, and it measures, you know, through tiny electrical impulses at a fixed position, um, preferably about 10 meters above the surface of wherever we are, usually the water, because we're mounting them on bridges more, but it's a stationary platform. University of Florida, Clemson, Texas Tech, anyone doing research, the anemometers are all placed out there in fixed positions, and they measure mechanically the wind on that piece of instrumentation. So I know how that happens. How on earth are you guys doing it? Because you're flying, you're moving through the atmosphere, and you're getting these wind readings. I've always been fascinated by how you do that. So how do you do that? So a couple different ways. Uh, uh, we have the drops on. So I'll speak about that a little bit. So okay. the drops on, um, when we release it from our aircraft altitude, it falls and basically the atmosphere, the winds, the thunderstorms take it wherever it's going to take. Gravity and the storm takes it wherever it's going to fall. And as that falls, um, it's reporting um, or recording uh, temperature, humidity, pressure, wind speed and wind direction. The wind speed and wind direction are derived through GPS. So it has a GPS antenna with, inside it. So as it's moving... It's, there's an algorithm uh, equation within it telling yeah. you basically how far it moved, and that's what the wind speeds have to be to get it to that location. That's amazing. So, that's, so it's math. So that's the, that's the yeah, the, that's the drop zone. <laughs> Told you um, this was going to be educational. And, it's math. We'll just leave it at that. So right. as it's falling, you know, it's not a straight line, obviously. Right. It's, it falls from the aircraft, and then a lot of times on a stronger storm, you might drop it in the southwest quadrant, and it may end up in the southeast quadrant. Wow. From 10,000 foot, you know, you have 10,000 feet of air between you and the ocean, and then you have, you know, yeah, counterclockwise the winds yeah. of anywhere from 150 knots to, you know, whatever, on, depending on the strength of the storm. So it's it's basically falling around it and wow. landing in the next quadrant. So that's how it's telling you what the strength of the winds are as it falls through that column, and then it'll get, um, it's an instantaneous wind. That's the other thing that you have to right. remember, too, is it's right before it hits the ocean and it terminates, it's it's getting that wind speed as it falls through the that column of air. So it's not, you know, it's not the strongest wind of the hurricane, and it's not the weakest wind of the hurricane, and it's not an average of the wind. I mean, there's a lot of different things that go into effect. Um, so... Um, drop signs can give you a lot of data about what's going on in the hurricane and um, and give you a good picture of how strong it is, but it isn't, you know, overarching and it's not right. everything about the storm. The other way that um, we are capturing winds is through this instrument. It's on our the bottom of our right wing. It's called the Step Frequency Microwave Radiometer. It measures basically the brightness temperatures. It's, um, there's a lot of equations and huh. calculations going on. More math, the right? Processor on our airplane, yep. which I know some of them, but I, you know, I'm not going to go into that. Basically, it's measuring how white is the ocean, caused, which is being caused yeah, yeah. by the wind. Right. So it's, it's developed. It was developed by a company, uh, ProSensing, up in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts. We've been using them for about, um, I want to say, for we've been using them since 2006. I think NOAA, since they're kind of the testing, yeah. the test bed, since 2005 or maybe a year wow. before that. So, you know, 12 to 15 years, this technology has been being used. Now, the other thing, the caveat with that is, is it is a it is gathering information from a swath, basically a cylinder or a circular area underneath the aircraft. And when we're at 10,000 feet, it, the, the footprint of it is half the altitude. Right. So basically, it's, it's a mile. Oh, okay. Circle right. underneath the aircraft. So it's capturing the ocean roughness 
underneath the aircraft, um, basically a one mile circle underneath it as you as we penetrate into the eye. Right. So, I mean, these things, hurricanes, can be gigantic or they can be, you know, very small. Um, and that is not all the information about a hurricane either. So yeah, the hurricane just another has piece. Do a lot of analysis sure. of all the information they collect. Um, we get some very good information from the step frequency microwave radiometer that is able to tell them how strong it is or how, you know, but it's only these, these swaths as we go into it and then we exit it and then we come back around and we do this X pattern. So these are one mile swaths of it. God, tiny though, you know, right. So there's still a lot of information yeah. of the hurricane that so isn't sampled. If they right. say it's five or 10 not stronger than what we've got collected in our data, they're taking into account that, hey, we maybe not gone through the strongest portion of the hurricane or, or other things like that. Wow. <clears throat> and um, then also the other last piece is our flight level winds. Yes. So our, we have instrumentation on our aircraft. That all is also very important information as well for the National Hurricane Center. Um, they do have rules of thumb that, um, you know, they use a certain percentage of the flight level winds. Right. And, go down to the surface however there's a lot of studies going on regarding that now too to see if rapid intensification if that actually works and things like that so a lot of people have to take these different rules of thumb with a grain of salt as well um because there's a lot about the hurricanes that we don't know yeah and it's constantly changing literally every That's second right. convection exactly. it builds pulsing, it collapses it falling apart. <clears throat> yeah right and i see you know, you all are able to be tracked on, um, I think, the most famous site in the world now, Tropical Tidbits, that Levi Cowan came up with, pulling your right. data and, and mapping it, and we're able to track that. And, and it's interesting to see uh, social media, you know, almost rooting for you guys, you know, all right, they're getting ready to pass into the strongest part now, or, oh boy, they're heading out there, and it's really starting to intensify. They're getting there at just the right time, but sometimes... You're on the way out, and then it starts to intensify on satellite. We're seeing that. Right. And you're like, oh, I wish they could turn around and go back. It's not that easy, right? right? You can't just, you know, hey, hey, let's go back real quick. It doesn't work that way, does it? No, it doesn't. I mean, there are times where we change in flight and plan. Um, so I mentioned before when the Hurricane Center or when the, our, our liaisons, CARCA, um, calls us in the day prior, and they give us the plan for the next day or two on the taskings that the Hurricane Center wants us to fly. Um, the next day, when the crews actually start showing for their times and they start getting preparing for the flight, uh, the weather officer calls at brief time and gets an update from those guys. And sometimes it's plan, you know, the storms don't listen to what we forecast sure. and predict. So, I mean, they could change overnight and they say, Hey, it fell apart, but can you guys do this? Or, yeah. Hey, it's strong. It's a cat five now. And we only want, um, the Northern quadrants tested because they're the ones that are going to be playing okay. fall. Can you adjust and change your mission? So there is things constantly changing. Um, the way that we do our mission, um, we don't do typically that standard alpha pattern. Now, a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll do certain quadrants or it's making landfall. They only want certain quadrants tested. Okay. So um, that's just, you know, something to keep in mind that it constantly can change. It can change in flight. You know, we get to a quadrant and there's nothing out there in a certain quadrant. Mm -hmm. Hey, the northeast quadrant is weaker than it is. Let's just forget this quadrant and fly these other quadrants, you know, so... It could change from the day prior all the way into the actual mission, what we're actually conducting and, re, you know, yeah. reconning. Yeah, it's, um, you have to be adaptable. It's very fluid, quite right. literally. Um, so, is just some general trivia about you. Um, so, how many hurricanes have you been in, if you actually have a number that you know definitively? Oh, it's 47 or whatever. And some notable missions that you have been on that you could tell us about. So I've been in, so we don't go by hurricanes. We go by how many penetrations of the eye that you've basically gone sure. through. And I think I'm in the, the low to, low to mid-70s. Wow. Um, so over the course of, 
it's been pretty active years of yeah. since I've was a student um and then now uh you know qualified uh, yeah. aerial reconnaissance weather officers so um yeah in the 70s and there's a couple people in our unit that are in the hundreds 200s i think we have a couple that are in the 300s but those are the guys that have been in our unit for a long time right and those aren't just weather officers those are pilots or navigators that yeah. have been around for a while 15 20 25 years in our unit um so that's kind of how we track it um <clears throat> and then some of the notable ones I've been in, uh, a couple of ones that I've been in were first hurricane that I flew in after being qualified by myself without an instructor was Matthew. Okay. So I got to fly in Matthew five, five different missions out of St. Croix. Um, so I flew in the mission where we actually upgraded to a cat five before it started turning north huh. towards Haiti. Right. Um, uh, kind of did a, uh, was a night well, mission. Good. It did a little loopy loop yeah. in the middle of the night it really threw us through for a loop because yeah. uh no pun all intended us. because yeah, it actually us. did that and nobody forecasted that all right and it caused us to be in kind of a a hairy situation where we were actually stuck kind of in the eye wall for about a half of a right. rotation right of the eye we got tailwinds behind us and we started going around the eye wall we couldn't when you get that you have to be really careful to not turn um, turn, you yeah, know, strong you get, turns, you hit, right. kind of want to gradually make it back in. So right. our gradual turns weren't getting us into the eyes. Oh. So we were basically halfway around. So um, that was the, one of the most interesting. It was That was a very turbulent one, especially at night. A lot of lightning. Pass. Um, it, it, not for it me. It wasn't a very, <laughs> you know, right. it was not a very good circle. There was a lot of... Um, undulations in the actual eye wall mesocyclones and um i think i actually made a remark and <laughs> actually spelled it wrong i die myself out here i spelled it i the shape of the eye wall that i um said it was it was a kidney shape it was kidney bean shape yeah yeah, yeah. so it was really weird um and then the the next one that i really obviously remember is irma I was in for its strongest point too i think wow. i flew Five missions in Irma, um, upgraded it to, I believe it was 185 mile per hour storm. Man. And that one, uh, that one was really intense. Uh, it was, I mean, the other thing to remember too, you know, whoever's listening or watching is it's not like this, you know, the entire flight. Right. That the three to five mile time period in these really, really intense storms it is, you know, the strong, the strongest part as you're penetrating the eye wall, getting into the eye. So you might be really, really turbulent, you know, side to side, up and down, sometimes lightning because these are warm core systems. So we're not near the, uh, the freezing layer or the, the minus yeah. 20 degrees Celsius layer where there's a lot of lightning sometimes too, but, um, we're not near that. So we're in very warm temperatures when we're flying because of the, those hazards. And if there's a lot of lightning, that's you know that it's a pretty intense dynamic sure. storm. And on that Irma flight, when it was we were upgrading and it was just plummeting, the pressure was plummeting. Um, it was really intense. We were getting rocked pretty good. But in general, there, you know, I mean, there's a lot of turbulence more than what you would experience on a commercial flight. Well, I would expect um, so. Yeah, but I mean, we maybe we get used to it and we don't really think it's all that bad, you know, after time goes on, but um, some of them can be pretty dramatic and some of them are pretty docile. They're not that bad. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm going to, I'll stick to tracking them on the ground. Um, <laughs> the turbulence is just not my thing. I flew up to Syracuse at the end of February for a big lake effect snowstorm up there and the Charlotte to Syracuse flight was the most turbulent that I had ever been on in my entire life and I thought you know that is absolutely going to disqualify me right there because I've um, <laughs> I've been invited a few times many years ago to go Stan, yeah. Stan Goldenberg from HRD has really encouraged me to come along on a mission I'm just like I find every excuse I can not to because i just i don't have the yeah. stomach for it um that's really fascinating so um in the eye wall of a hurricane 
what are some of the physical characteristics that you're going to use your eyes to try to look for that can help the forecasters at the National Hurricane Center determine more about its intensity? Is there such a thing? In other words, does the, you know how they say, don't judge a book by its cover? Well, in this case, how that eye wall looks, if it's, um, I want, uh, for the lack of a better term, if it's prettier, more symmetric versus kidney bean or whatever, does that affect intensity in your uh, your experience? That the, the more beautiful it is, so to speak, does that indicate it's actually more fierce that way? It's kind of an irony. Well, yes. I mean, a lot of people talk about what we call the stadium effect. Mm-hmm. Um, so the clearer the eye, the the more pronounced the cloud pattern is once you break through that eye wall. Uh, um, that obviously means it, it's more it's a more intense, uh, more put together storm. So the clearer the you know the, the eye is many times uh, means it's anywhere from a, a strong cat three up to a cat five. Right. Typically, you won't have those clear eyes with. You'll have a lot of debris cloud. You'll right. have a lot of um, overcast, um, dense overcast of you know, overshooting the hurricane. A lot of that um, mid-level clouds and even low-level clouds, um, the weaker storms. And sometimes you'll even have precip in the eye um, as you get a weaker storm. Yeah. So uh, tropical storms, they don't, typically don't have pronounced eyes as we, we penetrate into them. So um, a lot of times you won't even see a pronounced eye on our radar, Okay. even sometimes cat ones. Uh, So, yes, as you get a clearer eye, a more pronounced one on uh, radar, on our radar, our nose radar on our aircraft, uh, and um, and as we break through, they are a lot more pronounced, like I just, you know, kind of discussed with you um, from the visible eye. Um, what do we pass to the hurricane center and the forecasters and how is that really helpful to them? Um, in our vortex data message that we pass to them, we try to put some notes in the remark section to right. just kind of give them an idea of what we're seeing out there. Um, it kind of just helps them visually understand what we're seeing. Um, does it help them a lot? Some, some of the forecasters say it does. Some forecasters really are just looking at the numbers. Um, they're more prone to looking at our HD ops that we are sending out off the airplane that the observations that our airplane is taking and that we're ensuring and quality checking as we send off the airplane, as we go through it's um, 10 minute observations and their 30 second averages every 30 seconds, they're bundled up into a a 10 minute uh, observation and then they're sent out every 10 minutes. And they're really looking at those data. How are the winds trending? Uh, what is the temperatures at our flight level? How are the heights? Um, how What's the height field looking like? Uh, the pressure tendencies, all, all those things. So a lot of them are really looking at the numbers. And then when we send that vortex data message out after we've um, penetrated the eye and we fixed that lowest um, pressure, um, and then we exit out the other direction, uh, we'll put some of those enhancing remarks in the right. the data message for them, and sometimes it helps them. Sometimes it's you know it's just mere information, maybe for the common user or yeah. or you guys out there, what's going on, and what we're seeing. So, like if it'll say closed wall or something like that, that's you yeah, know, that's what you all saw. And if that wall is closed, that's, that's typically right. indicative of a stronger cyclone. And that's all. That's all based on radar. So okay. we don't. Um, it has to be based on our nose radar that we see off gotcha. the airplane. So it, when we say closed or open the southwest or yeah, yeah. Um, concentric eye walls, elliptical, you know, things like that, that is all based on what we see on our radar from our aircraft. And it sometimes it's challenging because there's our radar is kind of an enhanced software for us. Uh, they've done a lot of um, some of our forefathers in our unit, navigators that are really good at the radar, they've helped develop a more enhanced radar for software for our airplane, Mm -hmm. um, which allows us to see um, a higher definition 
um, basically DBZs or reflectivity right. on our displays. Um, the, the typical radar th display from a normal C-130J model does not have what we're able to see uh, prim primarily because theirs is weather avoidance. Ours yeah. is um, to help us uh, see... Um, it's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's helped us to see. Uh, we actually do have turbulence that flashes on our, our radar imagery. Uh, the different colors, very uh, sometimes dangerous mm -hmm. uh, signatures, tornadic signatures, mm. things like that. So um, it is help. It is, does help us avoid uh, safety of flight within the hurricane. Yeah, sometimes. But, right. You still got to go and in also there. Tell, allows us to see more of what's going on right um and um more of a descriptive for the hurricane center as well more of a description and yeah. helps us as uh, weather officers as well well um how many people and this is going to lead me into current events how many crew not counting media and senators and things like that that go with you but how many official flight crew do you typically bring on an invest, and is it different on an invest versus a full-blown hurricane? Do you have more? I mean, what's the average crew size? Our basic minimum crew size has to be five. That is a primary, an aircraft commander, primary pilot, a co-pilot, a navigator, an RWO, weather officer, and a loadmaster. So we can, fl we can conduct a tropical reconnaissance mission with those five people. Um, typically in this tropical storms, um, it all really depends on the length of the mission, mm -hmm. the length the mission is going to be. If there's going to, if it, if we're planning for a 12 hour mission, we will try to have a third pilot, um, because yeah. that's a safety of flight issue, uh, so that the pilots can rotate through the three pilots and, uh, one time, one of the pilots getting a, a break, um, Sometimes uh, an additional navigator or a load master if we're going to be doing a lot of drop signs yeah. or sometimes we do these AHPTs, these um, Navy airborne buoys, yep. uh, ocean buoys where we drop them out of our, our ramp right? and they go down and they shoot into the water and they, they test the sea So you actually put that solidity. ramp down and whew, What's that? you open that back ramp and out, out they go for well, real? Well, in the hurricane missions... Um, typically, they we have a tube that uh, it's a larger tube. It's okay. It's about twice the size of our drop sign tube, and those shoot in the they land in the ocean, then gotcha. they go down and they profile the ocean. Right. And I was. Those are intended to learn more about uh, the ocean, right. ocean temperatures and yeah, upper what ocean the heat content. hurricane is moving yeah. into things like that. Yeah, I envision um, so we, Fast and Furious, where you know that's in the in your launch. Yeah. So. <laughs> When we drop larger buoys, oh, here we, we go. do lower a ramp. Wow. We do lower the ramp, and we do do that for uh, hurricane missions sometimes if we're tasked uh, out ahead of a hurricane. I think Hurricane Michael. Okay, we right. Makes sense. Hurricane Michael, I believe we I can't remember if we attempted or if we did. I think we did get one mission off. Sometimes we have problems with aircraft, as right. we've talked about before. And if there's a maintenance problem where you actually have to turn back, yeah. uh, that mi mission might be scrapped. So we, um, I think they tried to, for Dorian, and we had some aircraft maintenance problems, and we weren't a we were unable to drop those. But I believe we did drop a few ahead of my. I think I remember that too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So so we do those missions as well sometimes, um, but those are not in the hurricane environment. Those right. are yeah, that makes prior sense. To the area we get to, we'll drop the buoys ahead, then we'll close the airplane up and then yeah. fly and do that mission. Right. That makes sense. Um, so, so, minimum of five, you know, but you could have several more, minimum, possibly. Yes, we can have, sometimes there's training going on, so we'll have instructors on there with students or people that need a cert to get a hurricane cert. Okay. Um, that are in upgrade training or a check ride. Someone's getting an evaluation, so we'll have an evaluator on there. So there's there's a various um, multitude of things that could go on where you have more than five people. Right. But the minimum to do a tropical reconnaissance mission is five. Um, I would say the average is six to seven. Um, wow. With other various things going on. Well, speaking of other various things going on, 
Um, I never intended as part of Hurricane U to talk about a viral pandemic, but <laughs> yeah. we, we cannot avoid it. And um, so, whatever you can speak of, uh, what are the changes? Any plans? How are things going to be different? Is the media going to be impacted that normally fly with you all? I mean, this has thrown the proverbial monkey wrench into all of our lives. How has it impacted aerial reconnaissance that you know of so far? Well, it's significantly changed the way that we do our daily work schedule, our daily lives. Um, when this all started, you know, as grumbling started in February and then late February into early March, um, we started seeing slow changes to basically the base. Um, and so what's interesting is, is we are a tenant unit on Keesler Air Force Base. So we're a reserve wing okay. on an active duty base. Right. And the 81st training wing is the primary, uh, that's basically who owns Keesler. Okay. So there's a base commander, which is an active duty commander, okay. colonel. Uh, who dictates what happens on Keesler. Interesting. For a tenant unit at Keesler, we don't dictate really what goes on to the base. So the way <laughs> wow, that right. they start posturing for the help, they're called HB cons, the health conditions. As they start posturing up, we have to start changing the way that we do and conduct um, things. And also, Interesting. You know, I don't want to put this lightly or anything, um, we have been basically... It's teleworking. So as as this thing started happening, I want to say the first week of March. Right. Um, they just basically, you know, to quarantine everyone that was not mission essential because we're really in a time period. So that it, I don't want to. I'm not sure what the best time period that this app would have happened, but it was an okay time period for our unit. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, just because. March, April, and May is a, a big part of our awareness season. So right. we do, you know, like you said, a lot of conferences were impacted, uh, weather, tropical weather conferences. That I think it's a big impact, you right. know, and us not getting together and things like that. However, um, it's, a lot of it, our season was awareness. So our Caribbean Hurricane Awareness Tour, our Hurricane Awareness Tour on the Gulf Coast, air shows that we attend. Yeah. Um, spreading awareness to uh, the general population was uh, impacted. So all, all of our trips were canceled. All our conferences were canceled. They just don't want anyone traveling. So, and then they started really minimizing people at work. Hey, just let's get everyone's computer work at home, start working on projects, things like that. So I've been home for almost a month now. Um, I've gone into work occasionally, you know, for short periods of time. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, people are um, basically. Um, we were we're down to one day of week of flying, um, so they're really trying to minimize um, people, you know, traveling on and off base. Right. Um, as we get later into this time period, there is there is going to be some effects. Um, what I can say is. Um, I, or what I would say is as we get longer and longer in this time period, which doesn't look like it's going to let up at least for this month. Correct. Um, uh, currency and proficiency would be my, my biggest concern and, you know, is our units concerned. So the people that are local, so really they're restricting people from traveling. So really the people that are going to be able to remain current are local full-time individuals and local traditional reservists. They're the people that are going to at least be able to remain current going into May and then coming up into the storm yeah. season. The people that are going to be impacted the most are going to be people that don't live within an hour radius of Keesler right. that are not allowed to travel into this area right now, okay. even fly or do anything. Wow. Um, so as we... As we start getting into May, I would say as May starts um, getting, less and less people are going to be current um, and even possibly qualified, yeah. which could cause 
the end, second part of May and early June, a time period where we're really going to have to ramp up. And, and if this is starting to die down, as hopefully everyone's expecting or hope, you're hoping, is if we're on the downtrend, it'll be a lot easier for right. that to happen. If right. we're not, then there's going to be probably some exceptions of policies and waiver, things like that. We're really going to have to start thinking about that because as we've all spoken before, hurricane season doesn't let up, you know. Yeah. Doesn't care. The environment, the atmosphere, you know, right. as we already saw earlier, you know, last week, Dr. Philip Fosbach, based on seasonal patterns and things like that, they're expecting a, you know, above na- average year for the Atlantic. Um, if that's the case and yeah. it pans out, you know, there's not much we can do about that other than um, hurricane reconnaissance is going to still have to go on. So It is. Wow. Um, how that transpires is going to be interesting uh, because I would just say, you know, we are limited for the, the, the exposure and the travel onto base right now. And then, you know, just like anywhere in the country, I mean, we're, we're being restricted to self-quarantine or stay at home and not move outside of our areas um, only for mission essential things. So I would say right now we're okay, but if this continues into May, uh, we're going to start seeing more and more impact. The longer this lasts, yeah. you're going to see an impact. And um, as far as the hurricane reconnaissance goes, or tropical reconnaissance, um, there's going to be have to there's going to have to be some. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of yeah. hard to explain, or because we have to maintain currencies and proficiencies yeah. to be able to fly an right. aircraft. Right. And then not only that. Um, there's training that's continuing on to get other people qualified right. to do what we do. And the only way to do that is in tropical season. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be interesting. I don't, no, you can, you can tell I don't that know it, what else to say about right. it. <laughs> you can tell that it weighs on you, that it's, it's not an easy solution. There's not a playbook for this, you know, and right. it's going to be kind of figuring it out as we go. You know, we're now less than... 60 days until the start of the Atlantic hurricane season. East Pacific season starts May 15th. Um, right. You know, I guess it's really a stay tuned kind of situation. And, you know, we hope that infection rates and deaths start to wane and we've gotten a grip on this through social distancing. But as we know, in our business, hope by itself is not a planning tool. I use that no. often. You know, that you cannot hope things away. Um, so that's... You know, good best of luck to all of you. Um, so on a more, I would, go I ahead. I will say, please. you know, the the one thing, the one positive side of just Atlanta hurricane season, and we all know of people right. that track them and, and do stuff is June and July typically are not that busy. Of right. Them. So we do have, you know, April, May, most likely June, and sometimes part of July before it really right. starts to ramp up. And so, Hopefully, <laughs> not that that's that's not the gospel. But, exactly. Um, you know, the time is on our side. I think, at least in the near term. Yeah. And you know, I will say that our unit and our wing is doing everything that we can to allow people to at least fly, at least remain current, um, and qualified. And they'll do. We will do our best come May in June to get people back in the airplane and in the seat to, wow. um, to be able to do hurricane reconnaissance or tropical reconnaissance, yeah. you know, in the Atlantic, Eastern Pacific and Central Pacific. So, well, we're wishing you all the best of luck. So before I let you go, people that are watching, um, and they're thinking, I would really like to do this one day. What is a typical, <laughs> Yeah, uh, to which I say, okay, good luck, because you know I hope you like roller coasters. I mean, I know that it's not always yeah. <laughs> like, but right. So what is a it's like that sometimes? Sometimes, exactly. Um, what is a typical path? You know the old expression. You know, what can you tell young people about how to do what you do one day? How would you go about becoming a hurricane hunter and doing what you're doing? <clears throat> Well, I would say there's not a, a standard, typical path. There's people in our unit that have taken various paths. I uh, will say that a few of us 
So my, my current path, I mentioned briefly in the beginning, um, is I went active duty. Uh, so I got a meteorology degree, got commissioned through the Air Force. Uh, there's a couple different methods that you can take to get commissioned as an officer in the Air Force. You need, you, you need to be in a weather officer. If you're into weather and you want to be a weather officer to do what I do, you have to be a commissioned weather officer in the Air Force okay. or the Air Force Reserves. Um, and then uh, I went 12, 13 years. There's another guy that went uh, 12 years and a gal that was 10 years. So that was the path that we took. We did a tour. We did multiple tours in the Air Force Active Duty. We did weather support, did various jobs that way. And then there's a path. Uh, a thing called Palace Chase or Palace Front. There's, it's a transition way to go from active duty to reserves, and you have to work through a Air Force Reserve recruiter to be able to do that. Um, you can also uh, go to college, do ROTC, and I believe you can go straight into the Air Force Reserves. But if you wanted to do that, you have to interview. Um, and get kind of be sponsored by our unit to say, hey, we want you when you dig, when you graduate, you've interviewed well. Right. Um, we would sponsor you to get commissioned and uh, come into our unit as a second lieutenant. Gotcha. Um, which there's a gal that did, kind of did, did that way in our unit. There's a couple other younger folks that are just getting into our unit now that um, they went active duty. Uh, one was a weather officer. One was a missileer. And they, um, they did, I think, two, three years in those jobs, and they wanted to get out from those and come and do what we did. So they got a little bit of active duty experience, but then transitioned to the reserves. So you can basically, if you're in college, um, start contacting us. And I will say, too, that you, if you're not into weather, if you want to be a pilot, yeah. a navigator, yeah. those are also officer positions that if you want to be enlisted loadmaster job, that's another job that you could do that has a little bit of the weather knowledge, but not as much. Right. You do more of a prepare the aircraft, check it before we fly, yeah. make sure everything's good to go. And then um, when we land, you take care of other jobs too. So there's four, there's four different jobs that you can do within our aircraft. Three out of the four have to be officers. Um, so you do have to have a degree and get, um, gotcha. get commissioned. Um, so you can do the, the ROTC program in college um or you can do what i did i went to college i went to a recruiter and then i went to officer training school did a three-month focus basic training for officers got commissioned and then went active duty um or you could do a tour when this is what i would say the the most ideal way to do it is and what a few of us say get commissioned or get your uh, meteorology degree or your degree, get commissioned, do a, a four-year tour on active duty, and then come over because then you have a foundation. You're, you, yeah. There's a lot of benefits. You can get the GI Bill. There's a lot of benefits that you can do and get um, kind of get your feet under yourself. Uh, you become a captain in the Air Force, then transition over to the reserves, and you have a lot of other benefits that, from the active duty side that would, would come along with you to the reserve side. Gotcha. So there's various ways to do it. Uh, but I encourage anyone, if they have questions, you can contact me or I can pass you along to our boss. If you're interested in interviewing um, for the meteorology side, our boss, uh, we, we hold uh, interviews uh, typically every six months um, if we have openings. And then there's the traditional side where you can be a part-timer or a full-time position. Um, and one of the other big things is the medical um uh, We've seen a lot of issues. You have to have a class three flying flight physical mm. in order to do our job. Pilots are class ones, which is a lot more strict. So there's different levels of medical requirements right. that you have to do in order to fly in the airplane as well. Makes sense. Um, I totally understand that. Believe me. Um, any yeah. other any other thoughts before we call it a day? Anything that uh, we left out that you feel like? Oh, let's tell people about this, or did we... I mean, we can't cover everything, but this is a good general look at how aerial reconnaissance is done, at least from the Air Force Reserve side. There's obviously... And you can speak a little bit about this before I let you go, perhaps. There's also mm -hmm. the, the NOAA side, and you know enough about that without us getting into a whole other hour. 
because that's what Noah does. But Noah does different things, but similar things, right? I mean, right. Yeah, they're t they're basically their job is uh, the research side of it. So um, they uh, they have two P threes and one G four, which is a high level aircraft. Uh, um, they do a lot of drop sons from the G four, so they get forty five thousand feet of atmosphere in a drop yeah. sun. Their P three can act uh, very similar as our C one thirty. However, they have scientists on board that dictate. Uh, what their task or their mission is. So a lot of their missions in her tropical are tail Doppler radar missions, mm -hmm. um, where they're they're going in and out of the eye wall and and gathering a lot of information about the eye wall, and that a lot of that data gets um, ingested or data assimilated into the forecast models, the right. models or the regional weather the global models. So right. um, then they have a lot of other instrumentation on the aircraft that they're either testing that eventually may come to our aircraft to become operational. Okay. Excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> pollen uh, is just pollen, folks. He's fine. Yeah, <laughs> there is a lot of pollen down there. Yes. Um, Tell me about it. Or uh, they're doing different types of missions that uh, Hurricane Research Division wants them yeah. to do to find out about the strength of the hurricane, or uh, they're learning about the, the hurricane, just the evolution of a hurricane. Yeah. Um, so they're more focused on, I would say, 90 to 95% research, uh, but they sometimes can pick up missions for us, or if <clears throat> there's a lot of storms throughout the globe that we yeah. have to fly, the Atlantic, Caribbean, Eastern Pacific, and Central Pacific, uh, they may be stretched out and tasked to cover other things, too, that the Hurricane Center needs them to cover as well. So um, they're, they're a little different. Um, Primarily focused on research, but okay. can do some of the operational side as well. But we typically do the brunt of the, the operational missions that you see, um, right. going in and out of the center, fixing it, gotcha. um, gathering the data from the storm uh, regarding uh, the forecasters um, and what they want to know. Do you, uh, and I'm, I don't mean this at all to be silly, but have you ever seen another aircraft while you're in the eye or whatever? You look out, and, hey, there's the P-3. Hi. Yes. How about that? Ironically, yes. Um, kind of weird, actually, <laughs> I think, in Hurricane Irma. So that's why, since they're tasked to do different types of missions, they may be tasked to do uh, the same time that we're going to do a fixed mission. So, right. For example, say we're tasked to do the 1730Z fix um, to get the data into the 18Z models. Okay. So we're fixing the... We're fixing the storm at 1730Z or around that time frame to get that data message into the 18Z models. The NOAA ASC might be tasked to do a tail Doppler radar mission at 18Z. So a lot of times, well, I wouldn't say a lot of times, but some of the times we might be coming into the eye and we were able to deconflict uh, via um, TCAS, uh, a system on our aircraft, and via radio. Um, and we're able to deconflict from each other. We fly at different altitudes right. as well. We maintain 2,000 feet separation between our aircraft. And then we're also within a weather reconnaissance area, it's WRA. So there's no aircraft that will be in that WRA outside of the NOAA side and the, the 53rd side. Interesting. So we are able to deconflict that way. And then uh, we're able to talk to them uh, just to verify position. Um, and there was one time in Hurricane Irma that... They, I believe they were in front of us. They, they penetrated from a different direction, came in, and then we're flying, and then we came in, and then we were able to see, I think they were two or three miles ahead of us. Wow. Uh, we were able to see them ahead of, you know, ahead of us in the aircraft. It was pretty interesting. I'm curious, how big is the weather reconnaissance <clears throat> area, which is basically like um, a no-fly zone for other <clears throat> aircraft, and does that move on to landfall? Because, you know, we're wanting to launch a weather balloon in the eye from the ground. And so that's not going to be an issue. But I'm, I, that's the first I've ever heard of that. How big is the uh, the WAR, I think, as you called it? You know, the weather... WRA, R weather right, reconnaissance right. area. It's really for air traffic. Right. It's to deconflict or keep other air traffic out of it if we're flying a storm. And then to allow us to deconflict from NOAA because they'll also be in that reconnaissance area sometimes as well. Do they file a um, NOTAM for that? The, the, the other pilot, like, 
I, I honestly didn't know that. I thought I'm that... not sure. So we will. I know we file them the morning of before a flight, or we file them before we fly before a mission goes out. Yeah. Um, so every time a plane is getting ready, a crew is getting ready to fly, we will we will file one and then we will send it to the FAA, mm -hmm. whatever centers that it, we're going to be in. Right. Um, that way they're aware, and then they will make sure that they do not um, have any traffic fly in and out of that WRA. Now, typically, the WRA is at a lower altitude. So if there's commercial airliners that want to fly 40,000 feet near a hurricane, oh, okay. I mean, that's up to the FAA to determine whether or not they do that. But it, our, our WRAs typically don't go from surface up to... I think they're typically 15,000 feet and below the surface. So Interesting. I believe our WRAs are surface to 15,000 feet. Wow. So basically that that block yeah. of atmosphere, and then I think That's they real. extend out to 250 miles. Right. So, um, so say here's the center of the hurricane, or center of the storm. Um, our typical leg lengths are 105 mile, nautical miles. So that direction, and then that other direction. So 210 miles, nautical miles, to the center so then there's a little extra buffer outside right. of that of, yeah. you know 50 miles or so so it's a 250 mile uh radius pretty large area of, of yeah. airspace that's kind of cordoned off for yeah. us and Noah when, v when we're flying very good well that uh we've we've gone over i typically want this to be an hour and a bit a little over an hour um I really appreciate your time. Uh, you know, I learned something that I never knew about the WRA, and now I yep. have proven that I can always learn something. That's what I tell people. I'm, I'm, I might be somewhat of an expert because I've done it for long enough. I've been in a lot of hurricanes, but I don't know everything, and this proves that even more. So I appreciate that little tidbit of knowledge. Now I know. Um, so I uh, really appreciate you being here. And um, so what we're going to do, folks, over the next several weeks, every Wednesday... 4 p.m. Eastern Time, we'll have Hurricane U uh, indefinitely until I've exhausted it or maybe the tropics get busy and it's time to put it on pause. But that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk to different people in the field. We're going to eventually talk to Ben Knoll. Uh, you know Ben Knoll on Twitter. He's down in New Zealand. We're going to talk to him at some point. We will talk to folks about specifically modeling. I intend to have, um, as an example, Dr. Phil Klotzbach to come on where we talk specifically about seasonal forecasting and eventually we will get into preparedness we will get into insurance and i know when we talk about insurance that we'll probably have five people watching because who wants to hear about insurance but trust me when i tell you you want to know about how insurance works because that is very important and we're going to have an insurance expert we'll talk about mitigation you know when this is all said and done all of us should have an honorary degree the whole coronavirus thing in mathematics and modeling and you know other things because we're you know we're learning about exponential growth like never before we're learning about modeling again and in this situation we're also he hearing about mitigation which is amazing the parallels to our world of hurricanes we talk about mitigation lessening the effects of something over time and anyway we will talk to somebody about mitigation i'm lining people up you figure Everybody's at home, so they're all available. It actually doesn't work that way because people are still very busy doing their work at home. And as we know, we have uh, people that have their kids to deal with. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Rickard and myself do, so uh, cool. other people as well. So we'll juggle all of that and we'll get it done and we'll have other experts on. So anyway, that'll wrap it up for Hurricane U for April the 8th, 2020. Uh, as always, I appreciate you watching. This is supported, by the way, through our patrons on Patreon. They make this available. Uh, it's not monetized. There's not going to be commercials, ads, overlays, none of that. It is supported very much like public radio is by a group of people that have my back, and that is our group of patrons on Patreon. So thank you to them for making uh, this possible through supporting my work. I am Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. Again, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Rickert, thanks for wa uh, watching. Well, you'll watch it later. Thanks for joining us, sir. Thanks for having me. And we'll see you all next week.